And so yesterday, when I was writing these notes, um, all of my things that I wanted to tell you in my one thing about my week begin with H. I had a haircut. Okay. <laughs> which necessitated doing some hoovering. Of course it did. And then I made some homemade soup. Very nice. No hummus to go with? Uh, beg your pardon? No hummus to go with? Uh, I have hummus, but not to go with soup. No. Okay. Welcome to Own It, Your Business and Your Life, with Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing money, and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty, and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. I was just going to say, how exciting is this? I know, I know. I'm here, I'm here, Judith. <laughs> well, when you were there last time, this didn't work for starters, so this is well, brilliant. Well, that's because we were trying to do it on some Taverna um, broadband, but here we have the super fast Wi-Fi from Cosmot, I think, which uh, lets me um, upload at half the speed that Phoebe gets at her house and she's been tearing her hair out, so I won't be doing much uploading, that's for sure, or it will be taking a lot longer. Okay. But downloading's fine and Zoom's working beautifully. Okay, excellent. Good. I've got my new portable blue snowball microphone plugged in. I've got a little desk set up in the living room so that the, the entire neighbourhood can't hear what I'm saying. Uh, well, that's one of the things that's been worrying me about being in the tropics is, you know, shouting at my computer all day long. Will, <laughs> will, you know, will everybody um, hear all my conversations? But, hey. Well, I've just realised actually the kitchen window is open, so um, I haven't cut down the noise completely. But um, I did record some audio earlier when I realised that the entire of Left Crow could hear. <laughs> <laughs> now, trust me to pick a place to live in. I can't pronounce. Show me your screen because you know how I love to see the timing thing. All right. One second, madam. Let me do the sharing screen thing. And then you can tell us about your journey and stuff. Yes, I have just written a blog post about the endless journey that was our trip from Shoreham to Stupa. <laughs> so you kind of you kind of made it worse to yourselves, didn't you? Uh, yeah, we did. We decided to go to Gatwick the night before, adding an extra five hours to the wait before we yeah. got to begin. But was that the only bad bit? Um yeah, it was really. Yeah, everything else was absolutely fine. We, you know, yeah. three, three and a half hour flight. We slept right through it, obviously. And uh, Stephen was there to pick us up as arranged. And he drove us to Stupa, 45 minutes in the car, lovely sunny drive. And there's a brilliant bit towards the end, Judith, where you, you just come around this mountain top corner. And then out before you, you can see the, the, the whole of the Marni Peninsula in, fading off into the distance and the three little villages of which Stupa is the middle one. And it just feels so brilliant when you yeah. see that site, you know. Yeah, I do. There's a site in England which is no, of no comparison to that, but I used to live in Oxford and I, I've driven from London to Oxford a lot, a, a million times in my life. And there's a bit where you drive, drive along the M40 and, the, and it sort of cuts through a mountain or a hill or something. And then suddenly the entirety of the Thames Valley is out there before you and you come down into it and it's just gorgeous, lovely. Yeah, actually there's something like that when you come to Shoreham as well if you come on the top road. Yes, yes. Yeah. So well, you've got the lovely view of the Downs and, and the sea. Yeah. And, the, and Lansing College, all, all, on, all you know, looking like very Hogwarts-like. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's all good, it's all good. It's cloudy today though. And you've had rain, which was exciting. Yes, well, not so much rain as a biblical thunderstorm of epic proportions. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, but they but as Elias said, you needed it for the olives. Yeah, exactly. The, yes, there, there, there are people out. In fact, the only um, break in the silence at the moment, apart from the odd uh, rooster uh, and dog barking, is the sound of the chainsaws that are cutting, trimming the olive trees because, you know, they're, they're harvesting and trimming right now. Mm. Well, as I speak to you, Nicola, I have an olive tree in my garden, which I grew from one that you have in a pot outside your front door. And then I, it, it outgrew the pot and I got the gardener to plant it in the middle of the lawn. And it's really quite big. 
Yeah, very nice. We had one in Shoreham as well. But the Five Brothers Taverna has upped the topu stakes on olive trees because they've got two, as you come to up to the, the opening of the, the Taverna, they've got two olive trees that have two branches twisted round each other as they're growing up. So oh, nice, yes. Yeah, a bit of topiary on, on the olive trees there. Are well, there actually five brothers? I think there's a, si- a sister as well. Don't the five brothers have a sister? No, the, fi- the sister is one of the five brothers. Oh, right. <laughs> Ignomy. <laughs> and, and exactly. And, um, and she, we think she either owns or runs a hotel next to the Taverna. But one of the things she does is she's, she's a mad knitter. So she's cladding all the um, lampposts in knitted costumes. Uh, I've seen you talk about knitting on lampposts before. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was, it's a rage, apparently, that swept through the world at some point, which we obviously missed, Judith. <laughs> I mean, I used to have to have my mother cast on. I have no idea how to cast on. I can knit, but actually I'm not quite sure why I would. Yeah, well, I'm, an, I'm a proficient knitter and crocheter because my grandmother figured out very early on that knitting, sewing, crocheting and, and helping in the garden was very good ways to keep small children occupied. So can you cast on, Nicola? I can cast on and cast oh, on. Oh, marvellous. In that case, one, <laughs> one day we'll be sitting in a place and we'll do a bit of knitting. Yeah, well, I'll teach you. It'll be yeah, marvellous. Well, well, you don't need to teach me. You just cast on for me and then I'll right. make it. All I can really knit is scarves, you know, things that go on endlessly. Might be a bit sweaty in the Caribbean knitting, though. Yeah, it's not. It's, I, I have to say, on my list of a thousand top things to do, it's about 999. <laughs> <laughs> I've had um, another other exciting news. It's the first time ever, apart from at Wildlife Festival, I broached the 10,000 steps on my Fitbit. I heard from Sarah that you were banging up a lot of steps because this is going downtown to do shopping and for supper and things. Yes, it's three and a half thousand steps to get down the road to go to the nearest supermarket and three and a half thousand steps back and if you Brilliant. detour to Calogria Beach or Elias's Taverna it, it, it racks up a creditable 8,000 steps. Brilliant. So I don't know what I'm supposed to do for the other two 2,000 just walk around the block I suppose. Go to Elias's twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Oh dear, what a laugh. I know, I know, it's bonkers. I'm, I'm quite delirious with, with um, the madness of it all. Now, I'm going to ask you two classic coaching questions. Go on then. Uh, what's better than you thought? Um, what's better than I thought? I was totally expecting everything to be absolutely wonderful, and it is. Um, what's better than I thought is the weather, actually. I wasn't expecting it to be this good this late in the year, but we were both in the sea yesterday. I've swum every day, and um, when it's hot, it's it's very hot. It's, we're looking forward to 27 at the weekend, oh, again, nice. for several days, yeah. Mm. And um, what, what haven't you got sorted yet? You've got that telly sorted out. Well, the, the telly is is a, an ongoing challenge. We've got we've tried various gadgets and various bits of software. We have VPN, so it does think we're in the UK, but that only works on our computers, our, our yeah, our laptop, yeah. computer, phone, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But the, yeah. if, the minute you start to try and cast to the television, you're using their proprietary system, which doesn't then go through a VPN. So it's, it's yeah. So it's who, which of the two of you has got the biggest screen? Uh, me, so we we're sitting watching. Um, we yeah. were sitting watching. Uh, what was it last night? Oh, well, cold, cold feet on a. So, so Nicola, welcome to my world. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it. No, no, because you're used to a great big gobble box, but yeah. um, you know you will get used to it. Honestly, you will. Yeah, it's just it's just infuriating that in this day and age, with three, four, four, a smart TV, four, three gadgets each, a, a modicum of of technical knowledge and the ability to do just about anything we can't bend this bloody smart tv to to play our favorite programs it's just well um, my computer man said and i mentioned this to you once before that if i knew the model of the tv where i was going he could get me the right cables and all i had to do was connect my laptop with the telly oh. and, it, and go through the vpn on my laptop and then 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 watch it on the bigger screen just like you had if you you know people have two screens yes yes on their computers it'd be the same yeah. as that Never yeah. mastered that either, but I, we are going to. I think we're going to um, get an HDMI cable, so that'll do it. Next, that's trip. what he. That's exactly what he meant. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Trip next trip to Kalamata. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And so, so the trip to Kalamata. What's that? Every Friday on a bus or something. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, the person who picked us up from the airport was offered to take us any time. So, um, okay. you know, there's quite a lot of people going to pick people up from airports and drop them off and things. And you just, you know, you bang them a few euros. And, um, and, and who is this, Stephen? Uh, he's a gentleman who's lived here for 40, 15 years or so. And he loves it very much. And he came out here with his daughter and subsequently met someone else and lives up the hill somewhere. Very nice. And how did he know you were flying in and needed a lift? Because um, uh, Yvonne emailed him. Hmm. 
It's, it's quite funny, actually, because Stella, who who's helps Elias out, who's British, she lives two doors down, and we were talking to each other on Facebook earlier. Yeah, well, I know. Well, there you go again. That's, that's what we said at home, isn't it? It's that, uh-huh. you know, you go, to, you go to America to see those friends of yours who live just up the road. Yeah, she's fixing up our cleaner, so who doesn't speak one word of English and who's coming from Albania on the bus on Sunday. So, mm-hmm. so um, she needs, she's going to come along and translate our requirements. Well, interestingly, I learned French so I could communicate with my French cleaner, but I'm not going to learn Albanian so I can communicate with an Albanian cleaner. You'll have to do that in sign language, won't you? Yeah, I think I'll just make a list and then let Stella translate it. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> Delegate. <laughs> so what's news with you then? Well, um, obviously I'm not in 27 degree temperatures, but we are in autumnal sunshine and I do have the, the uh, a combination that would cause my father to spin in his grave if he were not cremated, which is the central heating on and the window open, which is something I love and, and go on doing for as long as I can until it just gets too chilly. But it, uh, there's a, a nip in the air. Mind you, my, oh no, I was just going to say, mind you, my chrome is saying it's 19, but that's your chrome telling me it's 19 in Ios yes. Nikolaios. Yeah. Yes, I'm not actually in Ios Nikolaios, that's a lie, but it's it, 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 it place. Yeah. And so yesterday when I was writing these notes, um, all of my things that I wanted to tell you in my one thing about my week begin with H. I had a haircut. Okay. <laughs> which necessitated doing some hoovering. Of course it did. And then I made some homemade soup. Very nice. No hummus to go with? Uh, beg your pardon? No hummus to go with. Uh, I have hummus, but not to go with soup. No. Okay. <laughs> because I'm on a special low carb thing, so oh, okay. I, I'm uh, um, three weeks into it, and a stone and two pounds down. Very good. good. Uh, not a step taken yet, but don't rule it out. Eighty percent of it's the food, apparently. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else to begin with, the H you'd like to discuss? No, uh, not at all. I'm ready to move on to what's fueled your fire. Why don't you go first? What's fueled my fire? Nothing yet. Um, I'm basically, I, I keep feeling this m- urge to sort things out, make decisions, do something. And I, I, in the end, I just sit on the sofa and watch Casey Neistat videos. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the, this sort of overwhelming feeling I should be doing something when I don't actually have to. Uh, I think it's long years of conditioning. Yeah, yeah. And the hardwired belief um, that, you know, if it's going to be, it's bound to me. But actually, you're now in a place where you could enjoy having a wonderful life for a bit. And indeed, only been there four days and have been seen to be having a wonderful life with swimming and, and to learners and Uzo and photographs. And gallivanting around in the back of Katarina's delivery van. Yeah, <laughs> that was Sarah in the wire cage. Yeah, yeah. There was on, on a fake tree stump. <laughs> So it's that's what I love about Greece. It's so random. You couldn't make it up, could you? you couldn't know. Uh... <laughs> so what's fueled your fire then? Well, I've had a really nice thing happen. Um, our mutual friend Daphne, who's oh, yes. half, half responsible for you being where you are, um, and my mother's name is Daphne, which is quite a funny name to give the daughter of a farmer in 1920s England. But anyway, um, I wrote my newsletter about her two or three weeks ago about how she... I mentioned it on the podcast about how she did social media well. Do you remember? Yes, I did. No, well, I didn't tell her that I'd done that because I didn't want to be either a sycophant or embarrass her or anything like that. But typically, social media being what it is, she discovered. And she wrote me this really nice private message, which because it's a private message, I'm not going to share too much about it. But what she did share was, well, she said some very nice things about how she was honoured and moved and, and she found it a compliment and it means more to me than you could know. But because the whole social media thing had been, more, been one of her biggest struggles. Well, you know, most of my clients report that social media is a big struggle. In fact, yesterday afternoon I had a conversation with one that said, you know, she gets up in the middle of the night, she takes everything off Facebook because her business is very much related to her home and there are pictures of her home on the internet, and sometimes she gets a bit freaked out about that. And the whole thing about social media is how much to tell, how much not to tell, you know, how naked to be, how far or not to hang your ass out in your own language. And uh, I just had this very nice, long, private message conversation with Daphne about how she appreciated me saying those things, and how she, I mean, we've, we've put her on a little pedestal, Daphne, because she's written a book that we all loved and encouraged you 
particularly to take some Greek action. But she's just like the rest of us, like everybody's like the rest of us. And, it, you know, riddled with with uh, self-doubt, but having a go anyway, which is, I think, probably what we like about her, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. The thing that I'm most, um, I most admired about her was being brave enough to go and stay somewhere for on, on her own for 100 well, days. Well, I think she's a brave bird, because actually that's what she's describing in here. Bravery is always quite um, inspirational, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, it, I, I've been thinking a lot about how fearful I was before I came out because obviously, you know, the, the critter situation. The the most your 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 laugh, the most annoying critter that I've come across so far, and I've seen you know a few little Marnie worms and things when I get up in the middle of the night, which um, apparently you mustn't tread on them because they smell really bad. <laughs> But the, the most annoying thing was a, a common or garden house fly, which decided to take up residence in my bedroom last night. So I spent, you know, but I've been thinking about the fear thing about all, all of that and how how ridiculous. It's almost like I'm afraid of the fear itself because the actual creatures can't kill me. I mean, you know, obviously mozzies can sting you, but that's about it. But I just get so anxious about the feeling of fear that I, I'm anticipating to feel. Well, uh, is it time to revisit my favourite self-improvement book of all time, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway? I don't think I've ever read that, Judith. Have you not? It's, no. a really, it's a really simple, straightforward book by Susan Jeffers, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, um, because the only way to vanquish a fear is to do it anyway. Yeah, I do, I, you know, I do use, use the phrase to myself quite yeah. regularly. yeah. Yeah, and so yes, that, that that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. And the other one I really like is is actually um, a made up thing, which is um, the Bene Gesserit litany against fear, as proposed by Frank Herbert in his seminal sci fi classic June. If mm. anyone's read that, you'll know that there's a little poem in there that um, all about feeling the fear, letting it pass through you, and when when the fear has gone, only you remain. Somebody shared something yesterday on Facebook, which is something I experience a, a fair amount myself, which is how much bigger they get after dark and when you're lying awake trying to get to sleep. Yes. No, don't, talk, then, don't talk to me about sleep. No, no, no. I, I don't mean about bugs or anything. But then when you wake up in the morning in the daylight when you can actually do something about it, first of all, they shrink. And secondly, you just sort of crack on with all sorts of activities that engage your brain and stop you thinking about, you know, nameless dreads. Yes. Yeah, night night time's definitely worse. I'd slept, I slept very well the first two nights because I was so exhausted from the fresh air and exercise. But the l- last night was a, was a was a corker. I was awake about eight times. I'm not very fearful about creatures particularly, but I do have fears in the night at times. And one of the things I find quite comforting is to turn on, like you do with a child, turn on a little light somewhere nearby, because mm. then you're not totally in the dark. Well, Katarina's has not steered me wrong. I have a nightlight. <laughs> well, there you go. Lovely. Too, too bright, though. I'll have to find somewhere else. For yeah, it. Sometimes it's the one in the corridor on the way to the loo. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, put yeah. it out there. Yeah. So not actually in your room, but you're not, you're not in the dark where all the scary monsters are. Yeah. And I, I did have a terrible dream last night. So obviously I got a bit hot because that tends to make you have terrible dreams. Oh, it, I always say, we always, the, the expression we use in my house is, that, you know, when you have the central heating on too high, you slip into a coma. Yeah. And I woke up yesterday morning or the day before in the middle of a sort of dream where I'd left all of the keys singly in the boot lock, the door lock and the ignition in my Mercedes. Well, I don't even own a Mercedes. So I, I'd left my car... Completely vulnerable to, to be stolen. And guess what? When I came back, it wasn't there. Oh, it wasn't there. I'd left the boot key, the door key, and the ignition key in the key locks for people to steal it. What a funny dream that is. Unlike myself, who once lost a car in Soho and thought it had been towed away and was frantically ringing all the tow away people, only to find out I'd parked it in the next street. Alone. I thought you were going to say that you'd come to London on the train that day. <laughs> Oh my god. Now we haven't had a chance to talk in advance about our client challenge. It's all right, I've chosen it for you. Oh how marvellous. Off the list. Oh off off the list. I think you're gonna like it. If you are bored by working for someone else, or tired of trading time for money, or a business owner who's ready to travel and have adventures, then own it the summit is for you. We interviewed 18 inspiring entrepreneurs enjoying unique lives. Now you can dip into those lives and decide which of the business models will work for you. Our interviews will show you how to design your dream life beyond the laptop and how to live and work in your favourite ways and places. 
Our Intrepid 18 share the tools and techniques they use to work on the go and what living and working in total freedom really feels like. Find out more at ownitthesummit.com. Um, every bit of internet, SAS, which means software as a service, and startup advice says, choose your niche, your market, and your ideal customer. But how do you choose, and what if you can't yet? Now, I know that you have been dabbling with this issue yourself, and last week you told us you're, you were going to focus on middle-aged digital nomads. But uh, a, a lot of startup advice, you're right, is about you know choose your niche, your market, and your ideal customer. And I always think it's... a it's something to keep people busy at the beginning <laughs> because after a while once you start to get business and you start to work with clients and you start to get a real feeling of who your ideal client is it may not be who you thought of at the beginning necessarily but you kind of get past that thing it's almost something that you need to choose in the beginning it's like you know, startup 101 kind of slightly cliched advice. I think it's valuable. Actually, I'm not going to diss it. I think it's valuable. But the question is, how do you choose? Let's do well. Let's do two questions. How do you choose? And what if you can't get? Yeah, it's interesting because it's one of the things that Chris Barrow told us right at the very beginning. Who um, Chris and Guy were were very influential in my early online career, and I I couldn't choose either. I just knew knew I did want to be a life coach. So. Um, I remember thinking, I, I just started writing about the stuff I was interested in and then that grew into the money gym and my niche found me. But I always, you know, thinking about it, I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling, Judith. I'm still not convinced that's my niche. But I think the thing, in order to ha- be able to write a blog post and create a podcast and do the things you need to do on social media, you have to have a picture of someone that you're talking to. And it's quite difficult. Even if the picture, you know, the person you end up you end up working with isn't the same as that person, it does make it easier to aim your marketing at someone. Yes, I, I agree with you there. And you'll remember, and I think we've touched on this briefly before. Frank Kern has got his customer avatar right down to a man who's called something like Alan. He's <laughs> married. He's thirty-five. He wears chinos, a short sleeve white shirt, glasses, short hair, and he's I can't remember. You know, he's got he's got it right down to that degree. Interestingly, Frank's changed his avatar completely. Oh, he, he oh. Now, now he aims at coaches, experts, authors, and consultants. Mm. And he's trying to, um, well, he does very successfully um, get people into mastermind groups. They come to America and he um, he then sells them a package that they can... A high-price consulting thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mixed, mixed with Infusionsoft marketing programs that are already set up. Um, looking at it, James Schramko has a niche, which is not me. Interestingly, as I'm one of his biggest fans and a one of his members, he just changed his uh, logo recently to on his podcast to something a lot more superhero-y and masculine looking. And all the women in the in his um, forum were going, "Oh, I don't like that." And he said, "Well, we know that, but um, you're not my niche." <laughs> yeah, well, good. So they're good for him now. Um, something else is coming to mind here. Do you remember talking? Sorry to interrupt you in no, the flow. Do you remember? talking to us either last week or the week before about Alan Weiss's book, Value Based Consulting. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you get your computer working, there's a programme on BBC last night with Jacques Rossi, which is called something like Who's Spending Britain's Billions? Ah. And it's all about the high-priced consultants, PricewaterhouseCoopers and McKinsey's, who go into local, um, local authorities and uh, sell them value-based on a value-based outcome fee thing. Yes, see, that's interesting because um, those those kind of consultancy firms are the ones that Alan was talking about having the most problems adopting that kind of approach. Well, um, they do it on a two tier thing, like I suggested, which is they get a fee, then they get anything up to about sixteen percent of what they save if they do, if they do a cost cost cutting exercise. Yeah, you know. But the program was about how we as taxpayers should be incensed because, of course, instead of paying for 
um, layers of management at the local level. We're just paying it all to these fat cat consultants instead. But uh, I noticed that the Alan Weiss model was being used there. That's very interesting. And, and actually, probably it's uh, saving them a fortune because someone coming in and cutting through all the layers of crap and, and management people well, who actually them. actually no they're just spending it in fees instead and some of them are enough to run hospitals and things which have been shut down in order to pay the consultants but but watch the program because you'll see the model at play and and the iniquity behind it because there was there, a teensy bit of interference when you said the name of the program so could you say uh, that again? yes uh, it's called something like it's on bbc2 it's called something like who's spending britain's billions oh okay uh, if you look for Jacques Peretti, he's a very good uh, BBC uh, investigative journalist who is neither sensationalist, nor does he pick easy targets. Um, any programmes that he's in, and I've only seen two or three or four ever, are well chosen. Yeah, uh, okay. So, oh God, I lost my yeah, So back to the point, here we go. Uh, yeah. How do you choose and what if you can't yet? So I think you've covered the what if you can't yet, which is, well, actually I've got a nice little meme on this topic. Do you know the lady Jane Goodall, who was a, I don't know what you call them, a, a naturalist who worked with the monkeys? Gorillas. Ch- yes, gorillas, that's yes. it. Yeah. Well, she, there was a quote from her yesterday, which I think speaks to this. What you do makes a difference. And you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. That's interesting. That's a bit like your why, isn't it? Well, if you decide what sort of a business a difference you want to make and start writing about that, as you said, and I really believe this, you'll draw your niche to you. Yeah. That's very true. That's very true, except I don't want to blog. <laughs> so I've got to uh, no, speak then. Speak. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, do Audible or your own one woman, 10 minute podcast or um, Facebook lives, I guess. Or um, I don't know. It doesn't, it, you know, whatever the 2016 equivalent for you is on, um, you know, community building yes community no, building I've, I've got an, I, I've got to think this through because I, I blog on Swagger and Soul I'm nicolacancross.com which is my mentoring blog gets lots of blog posts from content that we generate or Swagger and Soul or old stuff and I just cannot I, you, I've got nothing you, you, to you, right. all right here's a one observation from me which feel free completely to ignore yeah well <laughs> you've got you've got so many websites and things now why don't you just combine it all into one I, I am working towards that i have not quite had the bottle to do it yet because it okay. is it is handy when someone comes along books it in my diary and they say you know they tell me their situation and i can see that they're either they're a clicks and leads client or a, a, a you know a more, a more sort of corporate marketing client and that fits more with wheelhouse and i can send them then to one website that doesn't talk about anything else except the solution to their problem if i can mm-hmm. find everything into nicolacairncross.com I, you know, that's much more of a mentoring, personal kind of website than the other two are. So, it, it's a challenge. But aren't they all? By, aren't they all buying you in the end? I suppose they are. Yes, I mean, yeah, I suppose so. I, I'd need to. I mean, this is what I'm here for, really, is to is to, re, is to think through all of this without yeah. the pressure of having to, um, you know earn a large sum of money every month yes. <laughs> so yes. it's, it's to give so let's go back to yeah, let's go back to the main question do you remember that nice uh, venn diagram which it, it's all to do with the overlapping of the sweet spots here isn't it it's yes. from, from my money it's what have you got in your historic cv that gives you cred what are you absolutely passionate passionate about now and likely to be forever and what do you love? So yes. mine is, uh, I was an accountant for 20 years. I've worked with small businesses endlessly. I'm actually coming up on the same in coaching now. So 40 years of, of coaching and consulting and accounting for small businesses. Um, what am I always going to be interested in? Money. <laughs> and what do I love doing? Working with clients. And there's always, if you can get those three, there's a crossover point where you can be of service. Um, I'm not wedded to this being of service thing. I think it can be overused, but... That's what people will buy from you, isn't it? They'll, they'll buy from you what they can see you've got credibility in doing. 
uh, so your experience and your, you know, da, da, da. and funnily enough, when you come to a new, finding a new niche, that's often the hardest one to bring in because I certainly didn't want to be an accountant or work with small businesses ever again after 20 years of accounting because they got on my wick. But <laughs> everybody could see that's where I had to work. And it took me, I don't know, three or four years to come back to that when I was ready to embrace them again. You know, so sometimes you you resist your own niche in that way. You're running because you're running away from the day job, and the last thing you want to do is to tell people you were an engineer or whatever it is. But it does give you credibility. It does, and the other thing is that you seem to attract um, artistic and crafty types. Well, that was a deliberate choice about three years ago when I launched Club One Hundred. I think it was. No, I can't remember. When I launched one or other of my coaching groups, and Sue O'Kell helped me, it was a deliberate choice to widen it out to creative people generally. Because, of course, my artists and my writers are still trying to make a business out of that. No, they're not. They're trying to make a living out of their creative pursuit. They're not, they don't necessarily think of themselves as an orthodox business person. But I love creativity in all its forms. And do you think they're, they're particularly attracted to you because you're... Um, well, I think I've started to speak to them. So when I suddenly realised oh, it's not just small business owners, because increasingly I was, having done the 30-day challenge with John Williams based on his book, Screw Work, Let's Play, I discovered a whole lot of people who didn't really want a business. They wanted to be self-employed and make money, but they didn't really want to own a business. And yes. they wanted to work out how to make money from the things they were interested in. And actually, that's what we're talking about here. So when, when I was trying to get them to start blogging about their thing or, you know, um, you know, niching or, you know, who's your market, who's your ideal client type of thing. They didn't know the answers to any of those questions. And I don't think anybody does at the beginning. Hmm. So that was the reason I work with more of them now is because I deliberately decided to open it up to them about three years ago. And that was not a mistake. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> yes. So if I was to think about that, I've got credibility because I'm an author. And I've also made a living online for 20 years. And a lot of authors don't make a living online at all. They don't make much from their books. No, that's I, a good so one. Yes. I, I think I would be endlessly passionate about helping an author to turn their book into I agree. A, um, an automated marketing system and program. Yes. You know, that they could run at several levels. Yes. So for some reason, I'm resisting that, and I don't know. I don't understand why. So that's why I'm giving myself the space to to think about it. Okay. So let, can I ask you a question about it? Yeah. Is, is there an assumption that you're making about authors that would make them difficult clients? Well, there's several. Yes. One is I may, I I have in my heart that they they're not willing to pay for the services, which is a nonsense because you don't know anything about people's personal financial circumstances, as we know, Judith. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that it would be great to work with those people on value-based fees basis because yeah. you can sit down and work with them, you know, and say, well, if we have this level and this many people at this level and this within a year, this is what you, you would earn and yeah. be earning ongoing. So yes. I think it would be a very good because the, the point of the Alan, Alan Weiss um, value-based fees is that it should be a good deal for both parties. Yes. And it should be um, that the person who is paying the fee should get between a 5 and a 20% return on investment up to infinity. So, um, you know, it's, it's a really nice way of having a conversation about fees. And it's a really nice way of earning for someone like me. And here's, here's two, good, two good things. I see about authors as a niche okay the first one is because the written word is already their tool of choice they won't have any difficulty coming up with content for you well that's the other thing I have to work with um, co content creators I can't bear it if yeah I that's that. the first one and the yeah. second one there's an awful lot of authors not not your top 100 best sellers and not your self-published bottom there's an awful lot of them in the middle who can easily afford you and know that they've got to get to grips with this stuff but haven't done it yet. Yeah, because they're publishing houses. Right. It? Yeah. Yeah. And there you have another thing is the potential to go to publishing houses and, and you know, offer a package to all of their authors or their best-selling authors. Well, you should talk to Sue about that because she did that with uh, two publishing houses that I can think of, or one or two. Um, I'm not going to mention them here, but talk to Sue O'Kell about that because she's had she's got experience of doing it. Yeah, we do talk quite regularly about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, 
because she's got the skills that um you know the really good systematic skills on how yes. to especially if an author's got a massive following on twitter or facebook or yeah Instagram yeah. she's got the you know the real detailed skills on how to draw out from that that that, that author's following yeah. what absolutely they need so yes yeah, so I mean we you know we keep we constantly talk about working together obviously Sue's had a you know a lot of a lot on her yeah. plate recently yes. <laughs> so let's just go back and recap because this is fascinating so you actually went to my questions which is what do I have credibility and who would I, and, and who does that make it logical I might work with and would I love to work with them Yes, I haven't I haven't worked with an author yet. I am an author and I have made programs out of my books or actually really what happened was the books came after the programs. The programs came first with me. So Okay, was, so here's here's an idea. Why not deliberately target a few of them? Why not make direct approaches to three? Oh, well, yes, I could do that because I do have lists of authors because I drew up loads of lists for the podcast, the mm. other podcast. Mm. The other thing I could do, I've just had, had a little brainwave as we're, as we're talking, is I have got a Science of Getting Rich Online book and I could create a course out of that, which would then give me the credibility of having done that for myself. Yeah, in market and yes. Sales can I make a suggestion about? Yeah. Well, can I make a suggestion about courses? The, the clients I've got that make money out of courses do it on the third-party platforms, like Udemy, which is all about each module is a video which you upload in quite small chunks. Okay, uh, everything, they, everything, in, all my, te- all my instincts are screaming at me that you lose copyright if you do that. Well, before you go there, what's wrong with it? What it takes off your shoulders is what you do all the time, and I'm a bit inclined to do it as well, and I think it's the natural assumption of people like us, is that we'll do all the marketing for our thing. So every time you come up with a genius idea, it's like, oh, my God, there's another huge mountain to climb. Yeah. Yeah. Why not just sub that out to get it done for you? Because then, you know, all you do then is you get a royalty check. Do it with something you're not too precious about. Yeah, yeah, that would be the idea. And also, it, you could do it as a um, a loss leader kind of thing and, and just make well, it... Well, uh, the people I know on there are not losing money, Nicola. They're making tens of thousands. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, perhaps we ought to have a discussion about... Perhaps yeah. we ought to get a special guest in to talk about that one because we've got, you know, neither of us have got any experience on it, but, well, I, I might have by, by, by the end of the month. You never know. yeah. But anyway, there you go. Um, now, let's just go back to this other question. What if you can't choose yet? Well, you just keep going. You just keep so you start. You, you start. Yeah. yeah. You start yeah. talking about what you're interested in and draw the people to you. Which is exactly what happened with the money, Jim. I didn't Yeah, know. but we're a bit full of ourselves. What about modest people who say to me, who's going to be interested in what I'm interested in? I didn't start the money gym feeling full of myself and I didn't even imagine that anyone else was reading that newsletter that I sent every week. I did it more as a personal accountability thing and it still worked. The main thing is to make sure people can find you and then make sure people can subscribe. I think your answer that you gave us two or three weeks ago about the one-eyed green sock wearing (laughs) geek in in their parents' basement. Yeah, in eight billion people in the world, they're they're more than enough interested in whatever it is that you're interested in. Yeah, that's what I meant about, and that's I think what you know when I say about that. That's what make sure you can get found. I think your thing about Udemy is that's a big platform where people can get found. Yes, quite. Because they, they've got some sort of SEO set up, presumably, internally. Exactly. And they also do that thing that happens on Amazon. I mean, some people complain about it because uh, it, you know, people complain about anything, don't they? But they do, the, with digital content, the thing that I love, it's a bit like having a baby, which, as you know, I've never done. When you have a baby, it, it, for the next seven days, you go, that's it, never again. And then seven days later, somehow, God or somebody erases your memory and pain, and you would do it again, and you repeat it, and people repeat it. What, people, what I think with digital content is you put yourself through this pain of childbirth, but afterwards all the money's free. Yes. Because you forget that quite quickly. Now, so what Udemy do very well is something that we see Amazon do, which is, you know, if you like this, you'll like that. And they also, if you agree, offer it to people for half price in certain promotions and all that kind of thing. So for me, any money that comes from it is free money because it's digital content I've created. And I don't think it precludes you from doing selling it yourself. It's worth looking at this. Well, that was going to be my answer, actually. Is it, yeah. Do you have to sign an exclusive contract? Go and have a look. I yeah, don't think I so. Will. I will. Yeah. I'll go and have a look. Mm-hmm. Because if, if you don't, then you could put it on gun, 
not Gumtree, the other one. Gum Road, yeah. Yes, Gum Road, and yes. you'll, and you'll sell it from your own website. But we haven't seen we haven't seen it working yet on Gum Road uh, for anybody we know. Whereas I've seen it working on Udemy for people I know. Yeah, I know it worked on Gumroad for Justin, but he was sending all the traffic. So, yeah. and the other thing I like about I think you'll like about Udemy is it all the content is in videos, mm. which are ah, so you'd have to upload them. And I mean, in Stupa, that's not great. That's well, it's we... not. Even, it's not that. It's the branding that is my sticking point. I'm absolutely hopeless at branding and design. But you just get uh, quite quite a lot of it. I think you're the talking head. So some of it's slides and some of it's you. Oh, okay. You could get one of your little Fino Filipino thingy ladies to give you a lovely template for a slide. Yeah, that's that's yeah. This, the, I I am. I'm finding so much resistance on so many different levels on this. I need to sit with it for a while, I think, okay. and, and just work through my objections. If I would do, I would go and look at one. Yes, and see. I'm going to. Can you yeah. recommend one? Um, uh, well yes, I can. I can send you a link to one. I'd have to go and look for it, but I think I can find it to one where a client of mine is making a reasonable amount of dosh. Yeah, that'd be good because to looking at someone who's successful with it would be a really good way of yeah moving forward and see also to see what the expectations of the Udemy marketplace are. Well, in. there are there are other platforms as well, but um, somebody explained that look more appealing in many respects. But somebody explained to me the other day, and I've forgotten what the answer was. Um, I've forgotten the explanation, but I remember the answer. Udemy is better because I can't actually remember the, the reason, to be honest. But uh, it, it convinced me. It convinced me to not look at the other one. There's another one called Teachable. Yeah, um, Justin Brooks moved his stuff off of Teachable. Yeah, and onto another platform. So oh, there you go. So I mean, if you if you want to do the own marketing, your own marketing, you don't need to be on any of these. But since you're marketing quite a lot of different things across a lot of different websites, why not outsource one to somebody to sell it for you? Yeah, yeah. That's I mean that's ah, good... ah, there's one snag you won't like at all with Udemy. You don't get the email addresses. You can do. Oh, that's outrageous. Yes, it is. Yeah, but there are other ways around that. Yes, you put something in the course yes, to, correct, correct. to entice people to come to your website. Correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no right. flies on you. <laughs> well, <laughs> it takes me a nanosecond to catch up. Um, yeah, no, that's great. There's a lot to think about in there. And I think, I think you know, the fact that I'm in this place is quite useful for... I agree, I agree. Let's go back to my quote. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Uh, I think that could be quite motivating for the people who don't want to choose yet. Yeah, what do you know? What do you want to be known for? What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want? If you were going to be invited to, to sit on the sofa at this morning, what would you? What would you want them, you, them to introduce you as? Yeah, I'm so disinterested in legacy because it's after I'm dead. I'm interested in what I, difference I can make while I'm here. And but the point is, I know what difference I want to make while I'm here. I don't want to have. I don't want my clients to need to take the forty years I've taken before they can confidently, you know, earn a living doing something creative. And then, and then we just find a gazillions of ways of, of cascading that message all of the time and start to share the thing you love. And my clients are very reluctant to do that because they think it's blowing their own trumpet or showing off or who's going to be interested in my stuff. Or, but they get there, Nicola. They get there. It's just those are all the resistances they feel at the beginning. It's a totally different set to the ones we feel, isn't it? It's really interesting. It is, but perhaps that's why they gravitate towards us in a way. Um, yeah. but what, I, what I notice is if I, I, I have to, at the beginning, say, trust me, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do, try it. And then I, recently I've had a whole rash of really good newsletters where for ages they've been a bit dry or they haven't found their voice or they haven't been commercial enough or all sorts of things. They all get there in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So... In conclusion, then, yeah, we are looking for. So, if if you don't know where your niche is, just start, and your niche will find you eventually, or you'll gravitate towards something like I did with the money gym. Um, if you know what your niche is, but you don't know whether there it's going to pay, you just have to go after it and test. What else have we come up with? Um, how do you choose that overlap of where's your credibility? Yeah. Uh, Where's your interest and what you're going to be interested? I, I, I try to encourage people to pick something that, like money for me. What are you going to be interested in for the rest of your life? Because it's a bit of a waste to start off creating a tribe around something and then go, do you know what? I'm really not interested in that anymore. And drag Absolutely. that tribe 
in another direction. I think you can if you're sailors with Gilbert, but I think it's harder for us to drag a tribe in a completely new direction, although not impossible. Although, you know, especially as we, we say it takes two years for everyone to catch up. Well, I don't know if you saw Nicola Bird swerve this week. Did you see? No, she's I going, haven't. She swerved. She's, going, she's going to make websites for people. Oh, I'm astonished. Because, you know, that beautiful website she's got at the Simplicity Project. Yeah. It's something she loves to do. She's got this beautiful website that she's banged up now. And that's what she's going to offer. Oh, she's so on to a thankless task there. Oh, I, must get, I must get in contact with her. The point is, it is possible to swerve if you have a tribe. Yes. But only, only if you're held up as the sort of glorious leader of it. Yes, and and in uh, what you're saying is a lot of your clients don't don't feel like glorious leaders yet. And I don't think they aspire to be, and I don't think I do either. Yeah, you're you're quite you you're you know you've got a, a good old tribe of people following you, Judith. I know that, Nicola, but I don't aspire to be some kind of um, figurehead. Well, that's all good leaders don't aspire to be a figurehead. Oh, well, there what, you go. That's what makes them great leaders. Otherwise, I'm not, I'm I'm not starry. I'm, I'm not starry. It yeah. shouldn't be about me, my worldview. Yeah. Okay, so have we, have we come up with some useful concepts on this one? I think so. I think so, yes. Uh, if you could put your thinking cap on about future client challenges, but we can add them to the spreadsheet, that would be good because we're running a bit thin. Okay, thanks. And um, I think we should go and, re- well, we've got the whole list to revisit as well, see if there's anything that we, we think need needs updating. Okay. Right then, word of the week, Judith. Uh, I'm going to start with portfolio, which relates to a word you chose a couple of weeks back where you talked about document as in documenting your journey. Yeah. I was speaking to a client yesterday afternoon who's a journalist and has been for about 20 years, and she's kept every single article that she's ever written in a lot of august niche journals, and uh, she calls it her portfolio. And she's creating a new website and pulling together some of her favorite pieces of that. And I just thought, what a wonderful thing that is, is to collect together over the years all of your work. Yeah, that's awesome. And it'll, it'll presumably hit the search engines like a ton of bricks. Well, she's a bit ambivalent. about as a, as a professional journalist, she's a bit ambivalent about social media. And because in social media, we give everything away for free. And journalists don't do that. But once it's, I mean, well, I, I can't imagine why it's been, once it's been published, she couldn't. Nicola, yeah. we debate that argument long and often. <laughs> I'm sure you do. In the end, I have to bow to her superior knowledge of her own industry. Well, not least because journalists are, um, no offence to your client, journalists are very Im- um, impressed with their own importance. Uh, and well, and I'm also a bit skint and scarce because their industry is shrinking and it's harder and harder and harder to get paid to be a journalist. And it's a horrible, iniquitous thing that as newspapers move online and their advertising budget shrinks, it, it, it fewer and fewer, you know, more and more people scrapping for fewer and fewer opportunities. Yeah. And that, but anyway, the point of this is portfolio. What right. a wonder, you know, remember if you're in that kind of a world. And this is the first thing I look for when I go onto a website of, say, a website designer. Let me have a look at your portfolio. Absolutely, um, yeah. First thing I did with Nicola Bird's site is let me look and see what you've done, you know. But it's not, it's not something I can do in my work but I, I felt this envy for somebody who had a body of work yeah absolutely and and the th- you know I just think that's obviously the, the best thing to do to to highlight her skills um, right. I'm amazed that the contract she signed for the pieces d- don't preclude that but perhaps they're out of date now well I think that's the funny thing I think you do keep copyright when you're a, a journalist but anyway back to you what's your word of the week well here we go well I'm going to play it play it first I'm not sure if the um let me uh let me... is it a tune well, hang on a second. I've just got to unplug my t- headphones temporarily. Hold on. I'll turn my microphone around and then go. Philoxenios exenos. Now I'm going to have a go. It's philoxenios exenos. Hang on, okay. let me have another go. Philoxenia sexenios, which okay. is hospitality to strangers. Okay, and I can't write it in Greek, obviously. I can see it in Greek, but I can't write it in Greek because I don't have a Greek keyboard. Well, don't worry. I will. Um, I'll take a screenshot and send it to you. To be fair, it is three words. Uh, yes, I know, <laughs> but it's a concept. It's one concept, which is that of hospitality strangers, which is interesting because xen- xenia is is also the word for xenophobic, 
And apparently Greeks are quite resistant to immigration, you know, people, migrants and immigrants. But they have this concept called hospitality strangers, which means that, you know, they're on a bound to look after you if you turn up in their town or their house or whatever. And I've actually always found um, Greeks to be very welcoming and helpful and kind. So that's my word. It's philoxenia sexenios. Okay. <laughs> I got better as I went along, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not really looking forward to our Greek lessons, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have picked a hard language there because it doesn't even, doesn't even really share an alphabet with ours, does it? Yeah, you still get used to it, though. Everything's upside down and back to front. And once you get that, your head around that concept, you're, you're a lot better off. <laughs> As my brother says, though, of the road signs in Wales, there aren't nearly enough consonants in them or vowels or something. I can't remember which way it is. <laughs> Okay, project updates then. Okay, so this is all about the podcast now, and um, I can report it's harder than it looks to pull out decent quotes for, because I listened to them, <laughs> which goes out this Friday. I've sent you a couple of them, but frankly, it wasn't a great week in terms of power quotes, but I'll keep listening out for them. Uh, I did ask for shares last Friday when I share it, and I've seen you sharing our older posts, and I've seen you making notes out of them and our first current note which i made with last week's show notes goes out this friday and i'll do that so we are between us making inroads into the things that we said that we would do yeah i'll carry on doing the notes we could have a yeah. very quick look to see if um if yeah i was going to ask that in fact yeah. i meant to check that before this morning's podcast funny enough okay let's have a look let's have a look and see if the note i made from the show notes of the, the one first, you made earlier yeah the first ever mm-hmm. podcast was um I'm just, I'm going to business manager to manage the page. I should sing a song. It's a Greek song. Ah, I've got an interesting fact about that Greek song you're singing, which is Zorba the Greek. Yes. Which was actually written at Cologria Beach, which is in Stupa. Oh, how marvellous. In, back in the 20s, the turn of the century, sort of 20s, I'll have to look it up. Long time ago, yes. There's an actual little house where the guy who wrote Zorba the Greek, whose name escapes me, lived, and the Zorba the Greek story was written after a very drunken bonfire party on, the, on Cologria Beach, apparently. Mm. So there you go. Sarah's got a picture of the house. We'll, we'll post it in the group for anyone. Oh, give us some insights on the okay. back of the right. I'm working on it, love. Well done for recognising my tune. <laughs> yes, it was a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Right. Up, up 333%. Hang on a second. What is? What is where? Okay, so... Um, Beach or something. Uh, episode one has done appallingly badly. That, which, no, no. Which, is, which is episode one? Episode one is this one. Oh, here. yes, that has done badly. Yes, it has. But what has done really well is today's podcast is live. I don't know what that is. Uh, we are, uh, no, why and who? Why and who did well? And also our 100th episode did well. But in terms of engagement, which is much better than reach, um, the why and who did very well. And also Jacqueline Rogers did very well. And the, and the, two, and the two we are lives. She'll be glad to hear. Hmm. Yeah, that, well, it's already late. We've only you've only got one note published on there. Yeah, just for your reference, you can if you go into Power Editor in, in Facebook um, ads, you can boost your um, note from there. Ah, show me. Yeah, hang on one second. Okay, cross media. Let's go. I don't never been into Power Editor. Wouldn't know what it was if you bit me on the bottom. Okay, Power Editor. It was quite dull for our listeners to listen to. Sorry, listen. She's showing me something in Power Editor. <laughs> got two things to discuss in the next section so we might have to delay this yeah i mean to be honest it's not going to be any use um and i'm i can't do it on the fly because my brain's going into meltdown no okay on, on the spot so but right. yes yeah, so just know that you can boost a note we're in power editor okay right um Next section. Yeah, who or what's impressed? I've got two in here. Can I go first? Yes, you can actually have the whole section because I can't give oh, anyone off. That's good. Here. That's good. So, Irene, the employer toolbox, her membership site. Very, very nice memes that she's sharing on Facebook. Going to all the points of pain of being an employer. Oh, good for her. Yeah. 
And, and I'm, I'm so glad she's now pivoting towards people who have got a vested interest in investing in, in themselves and their business. Well, they were so good. I had to put a comment, Irene, these are fantastic. Because actually, you, did, you wouldn't know it was Irene. I knew it was Irene, but you wouldn't know it was Irene. Do you know what I mean? That's what yeah. you know, Irene, fantastic. All, all the pain points about being an employer and she's addressing them in her Facebook memes. How brilliant is that? Yeah, I, I must p- p- PM her and ask her how it's going because um, I've just felt for a long time this is the way she should go. Well, do have a look at the employer toolbox on f- Facebook and see if you can see the nice stuff that she's sharing. I will. I will indeed. In fact, I'm doing it right now so I don't forget because I've got the memory of a, a gnat. Yes, a gnat, which you, gnat. you'll see a few of those off oh, in uh, where you are. Now, my other one it involves a, um, a client. It's not really about a client. Um Last week, I told you about the five-minute journal, and you said to me, oh, do you really need to do that in the book? Or in a separate day? journal, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, on Thursday night, I told a client the five questions. And when we spoke on Monday evening, which was four days later, so she said Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to practice it, and I was eight days into it by then, we both noticed that the emphasis of the questions in the five-minute journal had got us both tired of our own reasons not to do things. So your question, one of the questions you're asked in the morning is, what would make today great? And the question that you're asked in the evening is, how could I have made today even better? And you start writing down the same things over and over. You suddenly realize, oh, hell, Steve, I'm boring myself. I need to get a grip here and get some of these things sorted out. And it, it had changed in four days in her life, in eight in mine, and we both reached the same conclusion, which is, oh, look, I'm doing stuff that has been, you know, it's got us into action, basically, is what I'm saying, is that the questions, which look quite innocuous, have turned out to be powerful in terms of, you know, clearing those things you know you ought to do and that you'll feel so much better when you've done them, and then you realise, oh, it, you know, it, I've got to bloody do it, that's all there is. <laughs> So did you, when you talked about it, was it last week? Did you put the questions on the show notes? Uh, no, but I will this week. I oh, think. that'd be good. Yeah. 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 Because I, I need something to write in my journal because I've got, because now I'm blogging um, again on Swagger and Soul. I don't yeah. really need to write in my journal. <laughs> yes. Okay. I can even send you a copy of the sheet, actually. Yeah. That'll give me yeah. something to something to do every morning. And okay. <laughs> Right, well, that's it. That's a wrap. That's, it. that's, that's done the first episode from Left Crow. Yeah, well, do you know what? This is a good omen. What's that? The fact that well, it, it, well, it works so easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think we're good. All right. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. 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 See you next week. Yeah. Bye for now. Bye.
You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitthepodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com.